We must recognize that we live in a global world that we cannot escape. We must recognize that we are going to relate with other civilizations that we cannot escape. We must recognize that we are going to work with the Chinese, with the English, with the French, with the Americans, with the Indians, and with the Arabs, and that if we do not work smart, they will outsmart us. Because everybody does what is in their best interest. Has Africa defined what is in her best interest? I'm submitting that we have not. If we have, we have defined it very narrowly as Tanzanians. But what is Tanzania in the scheme of things? What is the economic power of Tanzania in the scheme of things? At the very best, the GDP of Tanzania last year must be below 50 billion United States dollars. I am quite certain that one of the big boxers in the United States of America can earn that in a year. What is the economy of Kenya in the scheme of things at $60 billion, or Burundi, or Togo? Perhaps the advertisement budget of Coca-Cola is bigger than the budget of all East African countries combined. That is the truth. Because I'm submitting to you that the Indian economy alone is bigger than all the economies of African countries combined. India alone. Brazil's economy alone is bigger than all our countries combined. That is why you see when the Chinese president invites African president, all of them, without exception, run to Beijing very quickly. And when they get to Beijing, they are given $60 billion, all of them, the 55 of them, to share. And I ask myself, why don't you ask Nigeria as Aliko Dangote? You don't have to move. Aliko will give you $60 billion. He has it. And if he doesn't have it, you ask Patrick Mosepe from South Africa to add a little more. And if you didn't ask him, and may soul rest in may soul rest in peace before he passed on, you asked Reg, Reginald uh, Mengi here to add a little more. He could. And if it is not much, there, there is no shortage of Africans who can give you that money, because there is no free lunch. Because nobody does anything in this cutthroat world where throats are actually cut without having an interest. I'm submitting that in order for Africa to grow, it is we who have gone to school who must ask ourselves, what kind of school did we go to? Is that great Nigerian singer, Fela Kuti, who used to sing in a song that I remind us about, teacher, don't teach me nonsense. <laughs> Perhaps we were taught nonsense. And there is a need to unlearn some of the things that we learn. We have to inspect ourselves because we who have gone to some kind of formal education in different parts of the world, in our unguarded moments, when you are colonized by the French and you are bragging about your child, you'll hear say, my child has been admitted at the Sorbonne, if you are from Senegal. But when he has been admitted at the Czech Diop in university, you don't even say it, because you think instinctively that the Sorbonne is superior. You should hear East Africans and former colonies talking how their children are going to the Ivy League school. Not the University of Dar es Salaam. We must decolonize our minds. Because the day we decolonize our mind, that is the day we begin to think right. Number two, we must define ourselves. Africa does not define herself. You know... I remember in 1989 when the Soviet Union collapsed. And it then meant that all the countries that had one-party states had to move into multi-party states. We were told by the conceptual West, and when I talk about the conceptual West, I'm including Australia, those countries that are geographically not in the West. They were telling us through their NGOs, and there is no shortage of them, that democracy means 
democracy defined by Europe and America means that you must have multi-party states and we formed them in the hundreds. Go to the Democratic Republic of Congo. They have 233 political parties. So that if you are looking at the ballot paper in the Democratic Republic of Congo, it is as tall as you are. Or as long as you are tall to speak correct English. Then we were told that democracy means that we must have elections every five years. And democracy means that the European Union and some other Western agency must come in and observe us and say that you little fellows, you have done a good job. That is effectively what they do. Once they have done that, then they print papers which says, now this is the index of democracy and we are very happy because Europe and America have told us we are democratic. Not the woman in Butiama. The woman in Butiama has not told us we are democratic. It's Europe and America. It's Paris and Washington. We must define ourselves. But when they are telling Africans that, they don't tell Kuwait that. No, they don't. They don't tell Singapore that, no. They don't tell Saudi Arabia that. That is staple for the African. It is the Africans who must be told what to do. Because he is incapable of knowing what he does. We must define ourselves. Who tells us that democracy must be defined by Europe and America? Can't we define our own democracy? Did we not have our forms and systems of governance before we were colonized? Isn't there merit in asking ourselves whether those systems can work better for us? Because experience has now shown that after every other election in Africa, almost the rule is we fight. Perhaps if we redefine ourselves, will begin to appreciate what it is that we must do going forward in order to unite. And in the pan-African spirit, we will be able to recognize that our unity is our salvation. And that is why I'm happy that the African Union has now come up with Africa Agenda 2063. But Africa Agenda 2063 could be one of the pronouncements that we make as a continent. Agenda 2063 says, not in so many words, but in effect, that by the year 2063, Africa will have changed. We'll be economically vibrant. There'll possibly be a, an electric train running from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, to Dhaka in Senegal, and one from Luanda in Angola to Swakin in Sudan, and another one from Cape Town in South Africa to Tunis in Tunisia, and that the entire basin of the, of, of, uh, of the Democratic Republic of Congo will be better than the Silicon Valley, and that we will be trading with each other about 60%. That is Africa Agenda 2063. And one of the things that they promised them, themselves and ourselves last year is that by the year 2020, all the guns in Africa will be silent. That is next year. Next year, there will be no more guns. A good thing, but you and me know that the guns are roaring even louder. Which means that we must now ask ourselves what it is that we must do. But it's a good beginning because it is a beginning of defining ourselves and defining who we are. Because let me tell you, and I don't blame the Chinese, but I worry about them and about us. Today, in any African country, notwithstanding that over the years our universities have produced professionals, the Chinese are the ones building our stadia. I do not know whether the stadium here in Dar es Salaam was built by Tanzanians. You will tell me. I need to be educated. But I suspect that there was a Chinese hand 
If you go to Nairobi, Kenya is the same. You go to any country, to Uganda, the same. And the Chinese are now in a very subtle way in every other African university, they are bringing something called the Confucius Institute. <laughs> Educate me. At the University of Nairobi, there is one. In Makerere, there is one. In Zambia, there is one. My brethren Tanzanians, tell me, do you have one here? <laughs> there is no free lunch. The Chinese have recognized that the mind is the standard of the man. And therefore, the way to capture our minds is to have institutes in our highest institutions of learning. Once you capture the minds of their very best, then you've captured them. In a hundred years' time, we'll be wondering how they did it. This is how they did it. This is how they did And I don't blame them one iota. If we were organized as Africans, we would be having the African institutes in each university where I would com teach comparative culture. Today, a number of countries are adopting Mandarin as the language of choice. We are surrendering to the dominant Chinese culture. And we are wondering how we will be a Pan-African. We are losing the war. We are losing it. The Chinese know what they want and they must be celebrated and praised for it. Because any civilization that knows what they want will always reach their destination. Do we know what we want? We don't. We must, in the nature of things, restructure our universities. Time has come that we must ask ourselves, what are we teaching at our universities? What are we teaching? If it is in engineering, you go to many engineering schools in Africa and look at the equipment that is being used. Perhaps in some universities, the equipment should be in the museum alongside the spinning wheel. <laughs> at a time when people are talking about nanotechnology and 5G, you go to typical African university, we're still using blackboard and chalk. And others are teaching differently, yet we think we are going to compete. We are not going to compete. Right now, people are talking about 5G. But what are we Africans doing? We are watching and observing and celebrating as if we are watching a football match between the United States of America and China. Asking one, which one will win?